So they have the negatives in, in the dark room. But the negatives, y'all, were extremely light sensitive, which means that if they were exposed to the light too soon, it would destroy the picture. And so the picture had to be developed in the dark. I'm trying to help somebody to know and understand that many times what you are experiencing in your life, you just looking around saying, God, I just want you to turn the light on. I can't see my way through this situation. I cannot see on the other side of where I am. It seems like all of my situations are dark and dismal, but I'm trying to help you understand that it's in the dark places in your life that God is developing the negatives, and I want you to understand that God does some of his best work in the dark. You ought to ask Samson because the Bible says that they poked out his eyes and they cut off his hair and they threw him way down in the dungeon. But the Bible says that it was in the dark. Come on here, somebody. That his hair began to grow back. And they thought he was over and done. But God did something in the dark. So by the time he came to the light, he was able to do what he couldn't do at first. I need somebody to understand that God does some of his best work in the dark. But this text that I've read into your hearing and we're trying to get somewhere. We almost where we need to be. Uh, in this text, we are in the book of Acts, Acts chapter uh, 16. And we know uh, that the book of Acts is the birthplace of the church. It's after Jesus has left and gone off the scene. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the Holy Spirit has come. And now we are in the church age beginning at the book of Acts. So it's in the book of Acts where we see God working through uh, men and women of God, but we don't exactly see Jesus himself doing it because he's working through the church. So by the time we get to Acts chapter 16, we find two names uh, that we see quite a bit often, uh, quite often in the scriptures together, and that is Paul and Silas. But they find themselves in a, in a bad situation, y'all. And, and in this situation that they are in, they have to understand or have to come to grips with the fact that midnight came the men of God who love God. And in the text, y'all, they had to understand how to manage their midnight because they are men of faith. They are uh, men of the word. They are men of stature. Uh, many times we would look at these two people and we would think that, that maybe these type of situations would not happen to somebody like this because sometimes we tell ourselves that if I love God and if God loves me that there will never be a midnight but the text is tailored to teach us that no matter who you are, where you are from, how much God loves you or what you have in, or what God has in store for you, every now and then you and I will have to manage our midnight. Paul and Silas are in jail because they have encountered a, a young lady who was full of the devil. And so Paul and Silas were on their way uh, to prayer and, and Paul got tired of the girl following them uh, saying that these are men of God. But the thing that's ironic about that, y'all, is that this girl was full of the devil. But she was the one who made the announcement that these were anointed men of God. Here's what I want you to understand, that when you are really anointed, God will sometimes use the people you least expect to make the announcement. Because here's the girl who's full of the devil, but she says that these are men of God who come to show us the way of salvation. But because she's delivered, uh, when Paul speaks and casts the devil out of her, her handlers got upset and they took uh, offense with it and they took him to court and they were beaten and they were thrown into jail. And that's where we are when we get to Acts chapter 16, verse 25. Uh -huh. But I want to show you what they show us in their situation on how to successfully manage midnight. First thing I want to show you that is if you are going to manage your midnight, first thing, point number one, you have to be sure to maintain your composure. All right, I want you to look at verse 25. I want you to look at verse 25. Look at what it says. And at midnight, y'all see that? Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Is that what your Bible says? So, so, so at the time 
of the text, verse 25, Paul and Silas have been arrested. They have been beaten. They have been chained and they have been thrown into prison. Now, now based on what they have been through, it would have been easy for them to simply just go crazy. Because for one, the justice system has failed them because they were being held on false charges with no evidence. Because the allegations against them was that they were troublemakers. When in reality, they had freed a girl from being trafficked. And they were not even given the opportunity to testify on their own behalf. So the system has failed them, but it further failed them because uh, the judge in the text orders for them to be beaten before they were ever officially convicted of a crime. So they, they have experienced injustice. They have been tried without representation and, and they were not allowed to speak for themselves. Then they were beaten and thrown into prison while they were still in pain. I want you to see what they're going through in the text. And they do all of that. And they're sitting there in prison, in pain, and in chains. And that's enough to drive the average person crazy. Sometimes you just never know what people are going through. How many things are piled up and stacked up against them and Paul and Silas are in a place where they could literally lose it in prison, in pain, and in chains. That's enough to drive them crazy. But I want you to understand that they did not allow y'all the chains to drive them crazy. Rather, they kept their composure and decided that we're going to have church in these chains. And in, at midnight, in prison and in chains, the text says that they prayed and sang praises unto God. So instead of falling apart, they decided we're going to have praise service in this prison. Uh huh. And instead of worrying about it, they decided that we're going to pray about it. Instead of losing their composure and going completely crazy, they decided that we're going to have church. I'm trying to tell you that no matter where you are and what you are going through, it's up to you because the first part of managing midnight is me managing me. Because I cannot change what time it is, but I can change how I respond to what I'm going through. I hope you hear what I'm saying. Now, we, we, we look at this text and as, as good Christian folks, we understand the power of prayer and we understand the power of praise. But in this particular text, Paul and Silas show us how to use prayer and praise to manage Midnight. I want you to see it. I want you to see it. Because for, for us, human nature is, uh, many times we don't start praying until we get into something. But then we want to withhold our praise until we get out. Okay, I'm going to say it again to make sure I, I don't leave nobody behind. We, many times it's, it's human nature for us. And, and some of us don't start praying until we get into something. But then we want to withhold our praise until we get out. But look at what Paul and, and Silas do. They, they use them uh, to manage their midnight because Paul and Silas not only prayed and praised in prison, but I want to submit to you that they were already praying before they ever went to prison. Okay, I'm going to show it to you because if, if, if you get home, I want you to, when you go home, I want you to look at verse number 16 because the Bible says that while they were on their way to prayer, I want you to see it, that's when they encountered the girl that was full of the devil that they cast the devil out of. Yeah. Which means, y'all, that even though they prayed in prison at midnight, they did not start praying when they got in prison, but praying in prison was just a continuation of a consistent prayer life. Because uh -huh. we got to understand that some people see prayer simply as a response to crisis. When prayer really should be a means of communication. And so for Paul and Silas, this is not something we do just because we're in trouble. But we talk to the Lord all the time. So they use prayer to help them to, help them to maintain their composure, y'all. But here's how. Because they learned how to pray before prison ever came. And I need you to understand that you don't need to wait until you get in trouble. 
to start then to learn how to pray. Yeah. You, you don't want to wait until you get a bad diagnosis to then start praying. You don't want to wait until the shutoff notice comes to then start praying. You don't want to wait until everything is falling apart and it looks like nothing is coming together to start praying. But you ought to talk to the Lord every day and you ought to have a, a clear communication with God and relationship with God before trouble ever comes. So they prayed before they ever got in prison. <laughs> but y'all then, but they praised before they ever got out. Because <laughs> the text says that at midnight that they prayed and sang praises unto God. And sometimes, y'all, all you need to make it through your midnight is to praise God right in the middle of it. And see, somebody said, well, Pastor, how can I praise in the middle of midnight? It's dark and it's, and it's cold and I, and I can't see and, and things are scary. How can I praise in the middle? Well, I want to help you. All you got to do is remind yourself that midnight is only one minute. I need to, I'm going to bring it, you got to remind yourself that midnight is only a minute because at 1201 it's morning and the Bible says that weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning but here's your problem with midnight because midnight and morning sometimes look exactly the same because at 12 o'clock and 12.01, it still feels the same. At 12 o'clock and 12.01, it still feels the same. At 12 o'clock and 12.01, many times it does not look like anything has changed. But I'm trying to tell you at 12.01, it's morning. You ought to look at your neighbor and say, it's morning time now. It's morning time now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At midnight, they use prayer and they use praise to maintain their composure. But here's the second thing that they do to show us how to manage midnight. They remind us, y'all, that you have to be mindful of your calling. Now I need y'all to stay with me so we can slow walk this together. Go to verse 26. Look at verse 26. You got to maintain your composure, but then you got to be mindful of your calling. Look what it says in 26. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Look at what it says. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Is that what your Bible says? Now, I need y'all to walk with me because usually, y'all, we get to verse 26. We see the miracle and we stop right there. And we just shout right at the miracle. We just we get to verse 26 and that's all we need. We go crazy and we shout right there. And that's because we see the miracle as the point. Yeah. But with God, you have to understand that the miracle is the outcome, but the process is the point. Okay, stay with me. I'm going to show it to you. Come on here. So, so if we stop at the miracle at verse 26, then we miss the fact that they were also on a mission. Okay, we got a slow walking, but I want y'all to stay with me, and I'm going to show it to you. Because you have to remember, y'all, uh, that this instance in Acts chapter 16 is not the first instance in the book of Acts where we see God getting somebody out of jail. Because if you go back to Acts chapter 12, you will see that Peter was also locked in jail, and God got him out too. So... If we just look at the miracle itself on the surface, y'all, they look exactly the same. Because they both went to jail, God worked a miracle, and he got them out. But the revelation here, y'all, is in the difference in how God did it. Okay, I want y'all to stay with me. I, I'm going to show it to you because in Acts 12, Peter's in prison. For those of you who don't know the story, Peter's in prison. He's chained between two soldiers, and the saints are at home praying for Peter to be released. So, in the middle of the night, God sends an angel into the prison, and he wakes Peter up and tells Peter 
come with me. Then Peter's chains fall off. He gets up. He gets dressed. And he walks out of the prison with the angel. And so while the saints are praying at the house, Peter walks up to the door of the house and knocks on the door. So while they are still praying for Peter to get out, the manifestation of their prayer was knocking on the door. I just want to tell somebody that they knock you here. That's your miracle at the door. That what you're praying for may have already manifested, but you need to go to the door. Tell your neighbor, answer the door. Answer the door. You think that it's a creditor. You think it's somebody that's bothering you. You think it's your past, but I'm trying to tell you that your miracle might be at the door. That's Acts chapter 12. Now I want you to compare that to Acts chapter 16. I'm going to show it to you because in Acts 16, y'all, Paul and Silas are in prison, same as Acts 12. They're in chains, same as Acts 12. Just like Peter was. Same experience. It's dark, just like in Acts 12. But here is the difference. In Acts 12, the saints were praying for Peter. But in Acts 16, Paul and Silas were praying for themselves. Okay? In, in Acts 12, uh, at night, Peter was sleeping. But in Acts 16, at midnight... Paul and Silas were singing. Y'all going to see it in a minute. Uh, in, in Acts 12, uh, only Peter's bands were loose and only Peter's door came open. But in Acts 16, the text says, all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. So the question is, why did God rescue Peter only in Acts 12 but release everybody in Acts 16? Y'all ask real good questions, so I got, to, I, got to show, I got to show it to you. Make sure you don't leave here with that question in your mind. Here, here it is, here it is. In Acts 12, y'all, the saints were praying for Peter, which means that their prayers were pointed directly at Peter's situation. But in Acts 16, Paul and Silas were in prison, and they were praying and the text is careful to mention, y'all, and the prisoners heard them. It's going to make sense in just a minute. So here's the difference, y'all. In Peter's case, the saints were praying for Peter at home, which means that none of the people in the prison with Peter heard their prayers. Lord have mercy. But in Acts 16, Paul and Silas were praying and praising in prison and the other prisoners heard them. Say, some of y'all got it, but I, got, I, I can't leave the rest of y'all behind. So here's what I want y'all to see. That while they are praying, the other prisoners are listening. So in Acts 12, uh, Peter sleep. The prisoners are asleep. They there praying. So the only people that hear them praying are the people in the room and God in Acts 12. But in 16, they are praying and they are praising and the other prisoners heard them. And I can just imagine, I could just imagine if they, if they had any Kojic in the blood. I, I can only imagine uh, what they were saying while they were praying. I, I can just imagine that they were there in chains. And I, I can just hear them saying, Lord, you are the God who opens doors. Uh, you, you are the God who makes ways. God, we know that you can deliver. Because when, when Daniel was in the lion's den, you got him out. And when the Hebrew boys were in the fiery furnace, you delivered them. And, and when, when, the, when the children of Israel were, were in Egypt, God, you got them out. God, you, you make ways out of no ways. Can't you hear him praying? You make rivers in the desert. And you make pathways in the sea. You brought water out of a rock. When your people were thirsty. And you dropped manna from heaven. When your people were hungry. And God we know that you're still able. Because when Peter was in prison. You sent an angel to set him free. And you didn't even need a key. Oh Lord have mercy. And God we know that you can do it. Because there is no failure 
in you. We trust that you can and we believe that you will. So we're not going to wait until the battle is over but we're going to shout right now. I, I want you to hear what it sounds like in the prison. In chains, but still praising. Oh, it's dark in there, but they still giving him glory. They're not worrying, but they are worshiping. And in the middle of their praise service, we used to call it a song service. The text says, y'all, that the prisoners heard them. Now this is going to wrap it all up and bring it together for you. Because while they were praying and praising, the prisoners were listening. But how does the Bible say that faith comes? Faith, that's right, my Bible reads. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So let me show you the difference. So in Acts 12, the saints' prayers, it was pointed directly at Peter. So God sent an angel in to go rescue him. But in Acts 16, Paul and Silas were praying and praising out loud and the other prisoners heard them. And since faith cometh by he hearing, that means that the, the prisoner's faith was built up enough to believe that if he did it for Daniel, he could do it for me. If he made a highway in the Red Sea, he can make a way for me. And if he rescued Peter, he can rescue me. So I want you to see it. I want you to see it because I need us to understand how to manage the midnight. So the difference, y'all, is that in Acts 16, because everybody heard it and their faith was built, that when God decided to work the miracle, he did not send an angel in to get him. He sent an earthquake to release them. I need you to understand that in, in Acts 12, he was just going to get Peter. But in Acts 16, he said, this is going to be a mass exodus. And therefore, I'm not going to send an angel, but I'm going to shake the foundation of the whole world because we all coming out together. And I need somebody who can believe that we are coming out together to look at your neighbor and say, we're on our way out. We're on our way out. <laughs> They were in the same predicament. But they heard them praying about how strong their God was. Even though they were all suffering, Paul and Silas were suffering successfully. And that's why the devil wants you to be silent in your situation. Because he knows that somebody around you that's suffering is listening. And what they hear from you may give them a hope to believe. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, you got to keep talking. You got to keep talking. Don't let him shut your mouth. You ought to tell your testimony. They overcame by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the lamb. And I need you to understand that somebody needs to hear your story. Somebody needs to know what the Lord has done in your life. But somebody needs to know that you're still in the middle of it, but you're still giving glory even though you ain't out of it. Mm -hmm. I want you to see this. I want you to see it. And so now I want you to see this from two perspectives because the people who threw them in prison did it as punishment. But God used that imprisonment for his own purpose. They meant it for bad. But the Lord turned it around for their good. Because I want you to know now, because Paul and Silas, they are thrown in the prison, which we can deduce, y'all, that the prisoners that were there were there when they got there. Stay with me. And notice, y'all, that the text says that there is Paul and Silas, but then there are prisoners. So the question is, if Paul and Silas are in prison, are they not prisoners? <laughs> Lord, have mercy. I'm telling you, when you ask the questions, that's what the revelation is. They in the same predicament. They in prison. But the text does not call them prisoners. It calls them by their name. I need you to understand that no matter where you are and what you're in, you are who God says you are. 
Don't allow your situation to call you another name. You can't call me defeated because that ain't my name. My name is Victory. You can't call me sick because I'm healed. You cannot call me underneath because I am above because Jesus gives me my identity. They are Paul and Silas among prisoners. But I remember y'all when I used to work at the prison. I mean, Mr. Hurd, you can identify with this. That there were two different type of people doing time. There were inmates, brother, you understand, and then there were convicts. Two different things, two, two different things. They're, they're, I want to make sure you get, there were inmates, and then there were convicts. Now, now a, a convict is somebody who either been in prison so long that they have acclimated to the culture. And so they can eat a steak with a spoon. Yeah, they know how to work that. They can charge a phone with two wires. They can took some, take some gum paper and do what no other power can do, just smile all this crazy stuff that they know how to do. They cook food in the barracks that look better than what you cook in the kitchen. That's a convict, y'all say convict. But an inmate is somebody who has not yet acclimated to the culture. Because either they ain't, got, they ain't got a whole lot of time, or they ain't been that long enough to get it. <laughs> Lord, I put y'all see it. And y'all, in the text, y'all, the prisoners are convicts. But Paul and Silas are just inmates. Which means, y'all, that even though I'm in it, I ain't going to stay long. I need you to tell somebody on your row who may be in something right now that, yes, I'm in it. But I'm not going to stay long. Mm-hmm. But I want you to get it. And so now, remember I told you that, that, that convicts many times have a lot of time. Or they are career criminals. And so then, with the logic, if the prisoners are convicts, we can say, y'all, that many of them probably have lost hope of ever getting out. Especially when you understand Roman law, that when they put you in prison, the intent was to, to come off with your head. They weren't just holding you because they felt like playing. They had something they were going to do to you. Uh, so, so, so the prisoners uh, were people that probably had lost all hope that they were ever getting out. But since Paul and Silas were inmates, they still had hope because they was free yesterday. I want you to see it. And so... Since some of the people in the text have lost hope of ever getting out, God says, I'm going to help you because I'm going to send hope in. Yeah. And that's why you ought to stop telling God, any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied and use me however you will. Because God may say, I'm going to use you as hope and I'm going to send you in to help somebody who lost it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they go in there, they're praying and they're praising and God uses their imprisonment for a purpose. There were people in prison who could not get out and could not hear the message of hope. So God sent hope in. But I want to show you something else. I want to show you something else. Because in verse 26, we see uh, the impact of their prayer and their praise. Lord have mercy. But in verse 27... We see the impact of their presence. I want to show you this because some of y'all get it mixed up. And you think that you caught up in it. But I'm telling you that for a season you may just be called to it. Look at, look at verse 27. And the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Y'all see that? But look at verse 28. But Paul cried. Who cried? But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Okay, here's where I want you to see the ministry of presence. Because y'all, if Paul and Silas had not been there, guess what would have happened in the verse? Because the jailer, y'all, had decided that he was going to commit suicide. But Paul was in prison to stop him 
Because Paul was in prison with him. And some of us don't want to go into certain type of situations because we don't understand that sometimes God is just sending us in there to save somebody and get somebody else out. It's not about you being punished, but it's simply because God has a purpose. So the doors come open, y'all. I'm trying to get there. I'm off most where I need to be. The doors swing open, and the jailer is going to kill himself. And then Paul says, don't do it, because we all here. And sometimes all a person needs to heal is just to hear from somebody around them that I'm here. Now, I ain't got all the answers, but I'm here. I don't know how to fix it, but I'm here. I cannot tell you the exact time when God is going to turn it around, but I'm here. There is power in presence. But I want you to see another reason why they're in prison with them. Because, y'all, when the doors come open, uh, the jailer's about to kill himself because he knows now he's going to have to pay for this because in Roman law, if these prisoners get away, then he's going to serve their punishment, which means he's going to die. And Paul says... We are all here. Y'all, that bless me because notice Paul didn't quote not one scripture. He didn't try to give him no counseling. All he said is that we are here. We're in the same position you are. We're in the dark with you. We're in the prison with you. We are here with you. And that was enough to keep this man from killing himself. But the prisoners, y'all, when the doors come open, what's ironic is that nobody moved. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if I had been locked up, didn't know if I was going to get parole, might die in the morning because this essentially is death row. Yeah. When the door swing open, you ain't got to tell me not one time what to do. <laughs> May the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another because I'm out of here. <laughs> but when the door swings open, Nobody moved. <laughs> Remember I told y'all there's a difference between inmates and convicts. If you are a convict, then you may look at the door and see something different. Because every time the door opens, it's just for somebody to bring something in, never for you to come out. Because they bring your tray in. They lift up the flap to put your mail in. When they get your laundry washed, they put the laundry in. Yeah. So they did not understand what to do with the door. So when it opened, they just stand there. But Paul and Silas are not convicts, they're inmates. Which means, y'all, that God would use them now to show these men how to handle a door when it opens. Yeah. I'm trying to tell you that sometimes... God allows you to be in a place or position because God says, I want you to teach them what to do with open doors. God is using you as an example to show somebody else how to walk out of what they're in. Y'all got to understand that some people have been disconnected from some stuff already, but they still stand in there like they still tied to it. The Bible says that they will know the truth and the truth will make them free. Which means that when you hear the word, it's the word that sets you free. But if you are freed from what you were tied to, but you still stand there, your experience will be the same. Because when their chains fell off, y'all, essentially they are free. But they are still standing there like they still bound. I just want to know how many of us God has already made you free, but you're still acting like you're still stuck. Well, well. You're still thinking like ain't nothing changed. You're still talking like there is no option to move forward from here. You're still acting like nothing in your life has changed for the better. You're still acting like you're still stuck. So Paul says, he says, don't do it. He says, because we all here. And what that shows us is that where you are is not just about you, but it's also about who you call to. 
This last thing, and I'm out of here. I'm out of here with this. I've been up here too long. They show us that if you're going to successfully manage midnight, you have to maintain your composure. You have to be mindful of your calling. But here's the last thing I want to show you. If you're going to successfully manage your midnight, you have to remember that midnight is good cover. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Look at verse 29. Look at verse 29. Then he called for light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. So I want you to see where we are chronologically. So after the earthquake opens the doors, and after everybody's chains fall off, after Paul saves the jailer from committing suicide, verse 29 says, then he called for a light. Now here's why that's important. Because throughout the text, we have only seen mention of midnight. Lord have mercy. But here in verse 29, we see the first mention of light. Here's why that's important. Because what they mean is that everything that God did up to verse 29, he did it in the dark. <laughs> Woo, Lord have mercy. So Paul and Silas were praying in the dark. They were singing when they couldn't see. Uh, the prisoner's faith was built in the dark. Their doors were open in the dark. Their shackles came loose in the dark. Because everything that happens in the text up to verse 29 happened in the dark. But here's what that means. That when they were in the prison around Paul and Silas, they never saw them. They just heard them. So they heard them sing. They heard them pray. So they heard it, but then when the earthquake came, they felt it. When their shackles fell off, they, they felt it. So, so here's what it's saying now, because somebody got to get this. Because everything that God had done up until that point, he did it in the dark. That means that until the light came in in verse 29, everything that happened, they only heard it and felt it. Their chain fell off. I feel freedom, but I don't see nothing. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I, I felt the whole earth change. The whole foundation has shaken, but I don't see nothing. I, I know that something has changed because I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. <laughs> Up above my head, I hear music in the air, but it's still dark. I, I know something has changed because I can hear something. Lord, have mercy. And I can feel something. But I can't see nothing. <laughs> so it was not, y'all, until verse 29 that they finally saw what they had been hearing and feeling. And what I'm trying to tell you is that God did it that way because midnight was good cover. Why is that, y'all? Because if God would have delivered them in the daytime... <laughs> That means that the sniper in the tower would have saw some prisoners running. If he would have done it in the daytime, that means that the warden and that the other officers would have seen a jailbreak. But since he did it at midnight, midnight was good cover because God understood that everybody wasn't going to be excited about their miracle. And that's why you ought to learn to praise God because he does some of his best work in the dark. When it seems like you can't see it, he's doing it. When it seems like you can't feel it, he's doing it. When it seems like nothing is changing, he's doing it because God is doing it in the dark. Midnight was the cover so that nobody else could stop the miracle. And God told me to tell you, I'm done. That just like the photo in the dark room development, God says, I'm doing some stuff in the dark. And when the light come on, 
and I present you faultless before the presence of his glory, that people will see that even when they could not see me, I was doing something in the dark. And I just wish that there was somebody in the sanctuary that can testify that I don't see it yet, but I feel it. I don't see anything, but I hear it. It ain't on me just yet, but I know it because God is doing something in the dark, but I just got to manage my midnight. Everybody stand, everybody stand, everybody stand. I just want you to know that no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's going on around us, God is on our side and his face is turned toward us. And somebody listening to me right now, your life is dark because you don't have the light of Christ in your life. Because no matter who you are and where you are, no matter how much money you have, no matter uh, how many cars and cribs you have, if you don't have Jesus, your life is full of darkness because he is the light of the world. And if your life is dark right now because you don't have Jesus in your life, I'm telling you <laughs> that 2,000 years ago, he left the light on for you. Because on the cross of Calvary, he died just for you and just for me. And now you can receive him into your heart right now and he'll turn the light on in your life. And if that's you, if you're listening to me right now, you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'm going to tell you that the only way, the first step to managing your midnight is to accept Jesus, the light of the world, into your heart. The Bible makes it very plain. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And it's just that simple. If you want to make that declaration today, want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior I just want you to repeat after me Father God I am a sinner but I believe that Jesus is your son I believe that he came that he lived that he died and that he rose again with all power in his hand and I believe right now God that if I receive him into my heart I have a right to the tree of life so Jesus I ask you now to forgive me of all of my sins. Wash me clean. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. And I'll be your child. And right now I receive you by faith. And I am saved in Jesus name. And it is so put your hands together for those who have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior today. But right now, right now, right now, as we're preparing our hearts to give, I want somebody who has given their life to the Lord today. I want you to let us know who you are. We want you to connect with us. I want you to put that in the comment section. I received Jesus. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. And I'm trying to tell you that the only reason we're all surviving is because Jesus is on our side. So put that in the comment section, I receive Jesus. If God has impressed upon you to be a member of the Main Street Church of God in Christ, I want you to put that in the comment section. I want to be a member. We want to know who you are. And a member of our intake team will connect with you to get some information from you. But if you are, have given your life to the Lord and you want to be a member of Main Street, but you say, I don't want to put all my business in the comment section, that's fine. We have an option for you. Because there's a link there, click to connect. You can use that link. Give us your information. We won't share with anybody. It will be used confidentially so that someone can connect with you in the way that you prefer. We want you to be a part of us. We want to be your church family, and I want to be your pastor. But also, those of you right now, I'm asking everybody who can and will to sow seed into ministry today. Because God opens doors. He makes ways. He's provided for us in the pandemic. He gives us the 100%. And he says, I want you to give me 10% in return. Our tithes we owe and our offering we sow. So today, I want you to sow seed into ministry. And if you're going to partner with us in giving today, I want you to use uh, that link, click to give. And you'll be connected to our secure online giving platform. And you'll be able to sow seed directly into the ministry of the Main Street Church of God in Christ. But also, if you want to give via cash app, use the cash tag, dollar sign, Main Street. C-O-G-I-C -C. and you'll be able to sow seed today and I'm trying to tell you that God will make happen for you what you make happen for somebody 
else. Main Street, our in-person audience, let's give our online audience a hand. Amen. And we will see you Wednesday night for Bible study. God bless you.